Brother Ted. And thank you, worship team. That was real beautiful. Nobody does worship like OCCEC, and that's for sure. You know, um, not to embarrass anyone, but my uh, dear friend Isaac was on the, t- the tubs this morning, in case you didn't know. He was fighting the hides, as they say in New York, and, the, and he played so beautifully and tastefully. You know, he has been so gracious. When he had to be away, he let me fill in for him, be his pinch hitter. And um, he'd always leave things set up and, and fixed up nicely. And so one Sunday, I came over here to speak, and, and I looked over, and I saw Isaac here. I said, I've never even heard you play. And he said, yeah, yeah, I was just laying low. You know, I had, I'm so busy this week. But, so I know he's fixing to go do something wonderful over in Taiwan, and, and I know we're all going to be praying. But um, I'm so thankful that I got to hear you play before you took off, and it was beautiful. <laughs> it's great, uh, unbelievable. And the whole team, weren't they wonderful? Let's give the Lord a hand for these guys and girls. This is a servant right here. These are servants, selfless. Um, today I'm going to start you off in something that's going to make you think that I'm fixing to feed you bromide or some medicine or something because who, who reads... Who reads Deuteronomy at least once a week? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, some, a couple of you are raising your hand. You know, that's like, rare, rarely do we tread in that part of the Bible. Uh, sometimes we turn back there and moths will fly out, you know, or we go to, and dust will fly off there. I used to think Deuteronomy was right next to Third Zerubbabel or something like that. You know, I didn't know where that was even. But every now and then, if we go back into the Word of God, we can find that we can mine out some rich deposits of gold in these places that we rarely tread. And so today, I'm trusting, and if you'll pray, we have a good chance that God will help enlighten our hearts and encourage us and strengthen us from something that we'll dig out of here in the book of Deuteronomy. This is a beautiful uh, section of the Bible where Moses was talking to the children of Israel as they were fixing to head out into the wilderness. And to tell you the truth, so much of the background and historicity of it, if I was to stand up here and tell you about it, for a few minutes you could hang with me because most of you are pretty intellectual and academic. But after a few moments, you would feel that old demon sleep coming on, right? Pretty soon I'd look out there, there'd be people drooling. Not drooling because I'm so handsome. (laughs) <laughs> but there's, yeah, I know I heard that rim shot, Isaac. <laughs> he sent a mental one. <laughs> but it's because that we could go to sleep thinking about some of this, but you watch what happens when we get our hearts into it, when we ask the Holy Spirit to quicken it into our lives. He'll give us something helpful. I want you to know that there's three of the most beautiful promises, in my opinion, in the whole Word of God in this section that we're going to look at today in um, Deuteronomy chapter 33. So if you have your Bible, look with me at Deuteronomy 33, 24 through 27. And if you don't, on the back of the bulletin, there's a little section for notes there, and the scripture is there. It's in kind of small font, but if you, if you squint and try, you can, you can read it. I tried last week and made an utter fool of myself, remember that? Or last time I was down here. So, of course, you're not all as blind as me and Mr. Magoo. And of course, nobody knows who Mr. Magoo is. <laughs> if you do, you've dated yourself. So, so look, I want to I read it to you, and then um, I want you to, to go with me on it, uh, just a little journey into this book of Deuteronomy. Let's see if there's, there's something in there that we can take home. You know, a real sermon stirs our hearts, and it encourages us, and really the truth is we, we preachers ask the Holy Spirit to speak through us, to kind of get us out of the way and speak through us. But a real sermon has take-home value. So I always pray when I get up in the morning and when I'm preparing in the week, God, I don't know what the people in there are going to be going through. I don't know where their hearts are and their lives are. Maybe they're pretty beat up from the world. Maybe they're needing something from you really, really stronger than what most of us know, right? We all put on our best faces for church like they used to call it, our Sunday go to meet and clothes, you know? We put on our best threads and stuff. Well, we put on our best expressions, but often the, if the shadow knows, if you could see inside, you'd see people that look pretty wrecked, pretty beat up, and uh, pretty dismal. So what I'm trusting is that God will shine his light in our hearts and he'll bring his encouragement. Nobody can do it like him. No wonder Jesus said one of the things about the Holy Spirit is he's a comforter. And it says when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will lead us into all truth. But it's also wonderful that he's a comforter. So I hope we'll get some comfort out of this message today. I'm going to read this to you. And in fact, I'm going to ask you to do something with me if you can. Because if I just read it to you, it's going to start you off already bored. So let's read it out loud together and really give it voice, okay? Let's read it. Ready? Go. And of Asher, he said, most blessed of sons be Asher. Let him be the favorite of his brothers. And let him dip his foot in oil. Your bars shall be iron and bronze. 
And as your days, so shall your strength be. There is none like God, O Jeshurun, who rides through the heavens to your help, through the skies and his majesty. The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. God is giving the children of Israel that he loves, his children, these beautiful promises before they go out in, into a time of trial and testing out in the wilderness, before they go to the promised land, he's telling them up front, you're going to go through some rough stuff. You're going to go through some difficulties. So I want you to know before you go out there, not only will I go with you wherever you go, like he told Moses up there on the mountain when he called him from the burning bush, he said, Moses said, I can't do what you're saying. I can't even speak well. I, I just can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And God told him the best promise you can possibly get. He said, the Lord God said, I will go with you wherever you go. And so he's telling these people, not just I will go with you, but he's telling some benefits of, of having God, the king, the creator. El Shaddai is the, is the Hebrew word. It means the mighty one of Israel. To have that God as your God. And he says, here's some things that I'm going to give you when you go out. And he starts off talking, it's a little bit esoteric, it's a little bit deep, and you don't know, what, who's Asher anyway? Well, Asher was a, was a man, and he was a progenitor of the tribe of Asher. And that's just one of the, the Israeli tribes that, and it's often used uh, when God will pick out one of the tribes or one of the leadership, he will also often use that as just a focal point for saying something to all of Israel. But I want to say this before we get any further in this sort of historic looking lesson. God's speaking it to you and to me. Because the Word of God, the Bible says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means God breathed it. It's inspired literally by Almighty God, the same one that breathed life into the first human. It says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man and woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So all Scripture, that includes Deuteronomy. It includes thirds of rubble, if there was one. There's not one, but just wanted to see if you're awake. <laughs> Somebody in the back row goes, wait, that's not the revised standard version. That's the reviled st substandard perversion, right? <laughs> so you guys watch me. <laughs> if I start straying away from Scripture, I might test you ever so often. But I want to tell it to you straight up the best I can, all joking aside. This is what he's telling the children of Israel, and this is what he's telling you and me right now in 2020 down here in Irvine and wherever this week is going to take you. Some of you thousands of miles away across the waters. Some of you just down the street or to university or class or high school or junior high or wherever you are in your life to your jobs. But God's saying to us, I'll be with you. And here's what will happen if you stay my people and keep me strong in your heart and follow me. He says, I'm going to give you these beautiful promises. And I think it's a promise for every day. I think in all three of these that I'm going to share, each one of those is a promise for every single day that we get up and that we breathe life again. And it pleases God to keep us going until he comes back or until it's our time to go be with him. See, you know, they're going to wander in the wilderness. He told them this. You know, he's going to have, have them wandering around out there for 40 years, as it turns out, because of their disobedience and their stubborn heart and several other factors. And then, in fact, a whole generation of them is going to die out there in the wilderness. And he said, I'm going to prepare you for these events, so I'm going to let some certain promises come into your heart. I want you to seize onto these. You're going to need them. It's like being bundled up and ready for any contingency when you get out there. And you know, God gives us these gifts of the Holy Spirit. He gives us promises. I was in Hong Kong once, and I was up on Mount Lantau, and this, this um, young girl broke her arm. She fell. The sweet little Chinese girl fell and broke her arm. Bone was almost coming out. It was almost compound. It was bad. And so we were way up there. In those days, there's just this three-hour journey up the rocks to get up to the top of Mount Lantau. So nobody could figure out what to do. And then there's one guy who was a young, strapping guy. He's thinking he's about a senior in high school or freshman in college. He said, look, I'll take care of it. You have to go down there to the bay, Silvermine Bay, and then they got to call over to the Army base, and they send a helicopter over. Long story short... This guy, he went all the way down the hill running. Remember I told you once before about <laughs> Mount Lantau Cobras. You know, <laughs> there's all kinds of things on that trail. <laughs> but he ran. He just ran like a marathon runner. He got down there pretty fast. And pretty soon we all looked. And way down there, you know, between there, there's this the bay there where all the jet foils are going out to Macau and all these places. And we see this army helicopter coming across. And it lands out there. It's so dramatic. And these guys jump out and they're standing there. But all of a sudden this one guy gets out. You could tell that guy's the man who knows. 
He's the doctor, okay? <laughs> he's, the, he's the doc. He gets out, and you know what he has on? He has on a jumpsuit, one of those, one of those jumpsuits, and it's got pockets everywhere. You seen cargo pants that have pockets on their pockets? Well, he did. He had pockets. And I, it was so cool. And the guy gets out. He wasn't arrogant, but he just seemed like he was so at peace. He was so together. So cool. So he comes walking down there. This little girl's sitting there with a towel on her arm, kind of crying. And everybody else is going, over here, over here. The guy walks over and he goes, hello, pet. He's British. <laughs> and she goes, uh, uh, and he says, uh, let's have a look at that. And he opens it up. He goes, ah, okay, no problem. All of a sudden, he starts reaching in these pockets. And he starts pulling out. First of all, he pulled out a, a little thing with some antiseptic stuff and a cotton ball. She knew what was coming. Then he pulled out this horse syringe. <laughs> but the little girl, the guy was so confident. When she looked at it, he goes, not to worry, love, not to worry. And so he rubs her down. He sticks his needle in her. And then he just starts taking care of her with all this stuff. He's got splints. He's got tape. He had everything in his, <laughs> in his pockets, in his cargo bag. So you know, what I, what I got out of that was this. And I've carried that with me all these years. By the way, it was, it was fun for her. After a while, she was stoked. Because she goes, God, thank goodness I broke my arm. I get to have this experience. She got to fly in a helicopter. You know, so this guy, he, he helps her and kind of carries her back over there. They, they fly out. So it was all good. But I remembered that over these years. And I remember when I read passages like this, that God gives us promises and gifts and help galore. We could fill up our cargo pants full of the things he gives us. And that's what he was telling Israel. You're going through a hard time. You're going through some hardships and trials. But I will go with you and I'll prepare you. So I'm saying that to you, OCCEC, this morning, that, that you're going to go through hardships. If you're not going through a storm right now, you will. And I'm not coming here to give you a negative message. I'm, there's hope in that. Because God's saying, I'm going to get you ready too. Have you ever had to go do something real hard and you're scheduled up for it? You're dreading it? But, you know, it's like before you went, you reached down into the Word of God and you started digging around. And you said, I know there's a promise for me. And you found just the promise tucked away back there somewhere. And it seemed like the Lord just whispered to you through that promise. That's one of the beautiful things about the living word. Because it is the word of God. He does speak through it as if it were some kind of microphone from another room or a, a megaphone from heaven. He says, you're going to need this today. And I will go with you. And he says, uh, don't be afraid. Fear not. Be not dismayed because I'm your God. I will strengthen you and I'll help you and I'll uphold you with my strong right hand. That's what he tells them. That's what he's telling them. And I, I think really God through Moses was not only telling the children of Israel that, but I know he's telling it to us too today. You're going to go through hardships, but I'm going to give you day, daily these precious promises, a promise for every day. Let's look at the first one. If you're filling in the blanks, here's what to fill in the first one. God gives his people daily strength. He gives us strength there's beautiful songs about that, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. But he will strengthen you. He promised it. And you might not think that's necessary until you really need it. But when you need it, you're so thankful for it. And once again, it says, And of Asher, he said, Most blessed of sons be Asher. Let them be the favor of his brothers. Let him be the favor of his brothers. And let him dip his foot in oil. Now this meant something special. You know, in Psalm 23, where it says, You anoint my head with oil. Oil was real precious back then. You know, it was a very special precious substance, not only to treat wounds and balm up the hurts in your life, but to make things smoother and, and to make things go, go well. And so they used it as not just in cooking, but in all of their lives. And um, I want you to know that's kind of what that's talking about. Now it says your bars shall be iron and bronze. What the heck does that mean? You're, you might say, well, that's talking Bible again. Well, if you look and dig around and check it out, it, it, the Hebrew word also means let your shoes. What it's saying is let the things that protect you, those bars and those citadel uh, bars and even your shoes, you're going to go out into the wilderness. They're going to be of brass and iron. They're never going to wear out. Nobody can penetrate them. No rock or thorn can penetrate them. He, he's just giving them this all-around blessing in this beautiful, poetic way that Moses is sharing what God gave him to those people. He said, let him dip his foot in oil. Your bars shall be iron and bronze. And then here's the part that gets me. This is the part that sends me. This is part, the part that stirs my heart. It says, because as your days are, so shall your strength be. I love that. As your days, so shall your strength be. In other words, whatever you've got to go through, whatever the next day brings, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to say, I, I don't want to get up tomorrow. I don't want to go through that final. I don't want to go through that interview. I don't want to go through that court date. I don't want to go through that hassle. I don't want to face my dad after I put a dent in the car. 
Dad didn't want a pinstripe on my car, okay? <laughs> but I thought I could get in that parking space. You know, whatever it is that we have to face. There's lots of bad things we have to face. But he says, whatever your day brings, that's what your strength is going to be. It's not a small promise from the one that created us, from the one that breathes life into us, and the strongest, greatest one that there is anywhere. It's so precious. This business about your shoes, of the, the Hebrew word, I looked it up, and it's most often used as shoes. Well, I want to play on that for just a split second. Your shoes shall be iron and bronze. There was this pastor named Dr. Angel, nice name for a minister, <laughs> but Dr. Angel said he went to a graduation one time, excuse me, and he, he was waiting for the people to come out, and it was a small school, but they announced the names, and nobody came. They announced about 23 names. That was all that was in that senior class. Finally, he looked back there, and he saw this group clustered, and they're coming like a snail across the line back there, and he's going, you know, you know, he's just sitting there waiting. Why are they going so slow? He looks in the middle, and there's some strange apparatus going along there. There's a young girl who's in this metallic structure. It's like braces. And they went all the way from her feet up to her shoulders, literally. And right next to her was this great big 200-pound football player-looking guy. And he was helping her. And the whole rest of the group were walking around in support, just creeping along, just as slow as it took. Nobody cared. We're not in a hurry. You're not going to hurry us. Audience, sorry. We're, we're going in the time we have to go. And when they got out there, they stood there for a minute, and that football player guy got announced. He was the valedictorian. And he came around there, and he said, before we do another thing, we have a, a medal to present. And they reached down under there and brought out the biggest medal you've just about ever seen. And he said, this medal is for Christine. And he pointed to the girl in all the metal over there, all the iron and steel and brass or whatever she was all encased in. And he said, she is our inspiration. He said, Christine always has a smile on her face. She always has a can-do attitude. You know that. No matter what we're going through, if we're suffering, we look over at Christine and we know we can make it. When we're out there on the gridiron, I'll be honest, when we're playing football, and we look up in the stand, we see Christine up there, and she's looking at us, and she's got a smile on her face, and she's nodding. And we know we can win. We know we can do it. It doesn't matter how bad off we are. And he says, so what we're going to do is we're going to give Christine this medal. And it is a medal, and on, on one side of it, it said, to Christine. And on the other side, it said, our class's inspiration. And I thought about that a lot. This young girl who had f feet of bronze and brass and shoes of metal, but she was the inspiration. What she did with hers was she made something so powerful and good. She let life come out of her life and strengthen to others so powerfully that I don't think she would have traded normalcy with anyone. And you know what's funny is you and I in some way have shoes of, of brass and iron in our life that seem like a negative and seem heavy. Sometimes it seems like things that we have to carry around and wear throughout the day are hard. But I want you to know this. God puts them on us so that we will be strong, so that we won't cut our foot, so to speak. He wants to make sure that we're encased in His love and His power, and we don't have to be afraid. And I just love to think of that. The Bible says, as your days are, so shall your strength be. At the end of the day, have you ever sat there at your desk or lay down on your bed and you go, man, I don't know how I got through this day, but I want to tell you, I got worse day tomorrow coming, and I don't know how I'm going to face it. How many of you have a to-do list right now? Huh? <laughs> Some of you have a to-do list that looks like Santa's scroll, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> it just goes on and on and on. And I got a pretty formidable to-do list. Usually, most weeks I do. But I've learned not to let that master me, but I've learned to commit it to God and say, Lord, I commit everything on there to you. Now, if it's, if it's urgent, that often needs to be bumped. Have you ever heard there was a book once that, came, that was on the president's desk, President uh, Truman or somebody, he's, he had a, a, these little piles on his desk. One basket said urgent, and one, one uh, said waste, and then one said important. And the only ones he checked when he came in was the one that said important. He didn't even look at the urgent. There's a book that was called The Tyranny of the Urgent. So sometimes what we think is so important and urgent, it's not. It just makes us nervous. And so... I sometimes pray, and God will help me to de-highlight some things that I thought was so crucial and move those down to my priority list, and he'll help me to be able to highlight the things that he thinks are important. 
And I tell you something, I wanted to be like that in my life. I want that peace like a river. I want the peace of God that passes understanding. In World War I, as well as World War II, there was a battlefield called Flanders. And there's a horrible bombardment in both wars. Isn't it terrible how sometimes history repeats itself in a negative way? Sometimes in a positive way, and that's wonderful. Praise God for that. But out in Flanders, one year, there was this horrible, in World War II, there was this horrible battle going on. And later, a soldier recorded this, and some other guys verified it, backed him up on it. Here's what happened. It, it was terrible bombardment, just going back and forth, fuselage after fuselage. It was just ripping and roaring. It was terrible volleys going back and forth. Finally, it became New Year's Eve. Well, you might say, well, that'd be fine for New Year's Eve. <laughs> you know, a few bomb bursts and tree bursts and stuff. But no, they were sick of it. And at New Year's Eve, what they did is they let it wind down. And they, they scaled it back. And by New Year's Day, 12.01 a.m., they stopped entirely. Nobody sent a message to stop. They didn't get any orders to stop. They just stopped. They just stopped sh shooting anymore. You know, it's New Year's Day, for goodness sakes crazy. The allies, the British and the Americans over here, the Germans over there, they're just trying to pulverize each other, but they stopped. So on New Year's Day, here's what this guy wrote. He said, you know, we were listening and our ears were almost deafened from all that, you know, bombardment going on. But he said, what we heard that morning was this. Have you ever heard the sound of a field lark song? There's a beautiful little lark called a metal lark or field lark. And they have this song that's so beautiful and it just it just brightens up the world. And they're going and making this noise, you know. And it's so, by the way, my father, before he died, he and I used to go out to his ranch and, and ride dune buggies. You talk about a weird old lawyer dad, you know. And, uh, and by the way, I've never prayed so well and so hard as when I rode with my father in the dune buggy. <laughs> my father would hit the, I mean, he just seemed like he was bent on self-destruction. He loved it. He'd go up and turn that thing around <clears throat> and then he'd sit there and he'd laugh like a little kid. And one day, when we finished laughing and the dust started settling, we're sitting out in his meadow and we heard a field lark. And this lark was so beautiful. And it was right about the time in spring where the, the peach blossoms were coming out. And you could smell flowers and hear this lark. And my father looks over at me and he said, I'll tell you, Ewan, he said, this is what I think heaven will be like. He said, it sure would be for me. He said, I don't care much about floating around on a cloud or playing a harp or anything like that, <laughs> like the stereotypes. But he said, if heaven is like this, while well, we're out here doing stuff like this, and then we hear that field lark, man, that's beautiful. And this guy said, that's what he heard, the field lark song. And the, the birds seem to be singing that it's a new day. It's a new year. It's a new start. Now there's hope for peace. There's hope for an end to this insanity of war, this, this killing of each other. And there's a trust that in the midst of all the battles and hardships of life, there's going to be a time for peace. The Prince of Peace is going to win out and establish it. And we know at least it'll be here, there, or in the air that there'll be that peace. There's a song that God places in our hearts when we're going about. Because it says, as your days are, so shall your strength be. I love that promise. You know, there's another rarely visited place. I think this is the most rarely visited book in the Bible, Lamentations. Have you ever heard that? Anybody ever even heard of that? <laughs> Everybody been stumbling around your table of contents? You know, lamentations, one reason people don't go rushing to lamentations is, what does the word mean? To lament means to grieve, right? And to weep. So who wants to go to the book of grieving? You know? I mean, it sounds a little bit un uninviting to me. And, and well, it might be because lamentations begins with a sigh, it continues with tears, and it ends with sorrow. But isn't it funny, typically... As in so many things in life, in the middle of a burned out field, you see one little plot of flowers growing. And there's, there's some verses like that in Lamentations that is so beautiful. Here's one that I love. It's Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. It says this, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. Anybody ever heard a song like that? The steadfast of the Lord, love of the Lord never changes. Well, I'm telling you something. That passage is so beautiful because it's just backing up what, it, what the Lord said through Moses to the children of Israel and to the children of Irvine <laughs> and the children of us in California. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. I'm trying to say it in Texas, Texas way. You know, we say tacos and enchiladas and we say <laughs> Costa Mesa. You know, and anyway, I digress. But you already know Texans are done. Why am I belaboring the point, right? It's established, Your Honor. I ask you to take judicial notice, notice that Texans can't speak English. <laughs> 
But I love to read this. Man, I love to read it and let, get that up in me when I'm reading the scripture. And all of a sudden I'll read, the steadfast love in Lamentations, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. There's not an end of them. There's not a small reservoir. It's not, oh gosh, it's empty. It says they are new every morning. I love that. You know, it says, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. That's what the Bible says. Today, I want you to hear this promise that God is saying to you and me. He's saying, no matter what you go through, no matter how bleak it gets, no matter how long the day gets, no matter how rough the trials are, but I'm telling you, as your days are, so shall your strength be, and you're going to have strength new every morning. The steadfast love of the Lord is going to come back. Weeping might endure for the night. But joy comes in the morning. When you wake up in the morning, whisper a praise to God. Say, Lord, praise you. Good morning, Lord. I'm so glad to be here today. How many of you have said, good morning, Lord? You know, some of you, if you're honest, you don't say that. You say, good Lord, it's morning. <laughs> Most of us do that. Kick the alarm clock, you know. Boy, I've threatened to murder that alarm clock many times, you know. But, man, I tell you something. God is waiting for us to say, Lord, I love you. I know you're here. I want what you got for me. And I just praise Him for that. See, I just love that, that God's telling us through lamentations and through struggles and difficulties, there's beauty on the other side. I love this fact. The Bible says that the entrance to heaven is made of solid pearl. It does say that. You hear people joking about the pearly gates. Well, if you read in Revelation, if you read in the Bible, it says the entrance, the entrance way to heaven is pearl. You know why I love that so much? Because how do you get a pearl? From the suffering of a little or a tiny little oyster. Maybe something gets in there and first it's just an irritation. And pretty soon it's so radical and it rags and it just totally debilitates that little creature. But you know what happens? This is amazing. Over time, that little creature secretes the substance that becomes this strange little deal that turns out to be priceless and beautiful. And I believe that that's what happens to us when we're walking in that entrance way. Not only are we going to look at that thing, so I went through suffering in a fallen, broken world. I went through struggles day after day. It almost seemed like morning, morning, new hassles I see. That's what it seemed like to me sometimes. But God got me through it. And through it all, I learned to depend on Him. And here I am. But also, going through that corridor, that entryway into heaven, we realize that we're there because of Jesus' suffering. Because of the pearl of great price, Jesus Christ. That we would sell everything we have to get Him in our hearts, or we wouldn't be there. And He suffered and died. How much does He love us? He stretched out His hands and said, I love you this much. And He was crucified on the cross for you and me. Never forget, the reason we're here as a, fam a church family together, the reason we're in this forever family that is this church, it's because of Jesus that He suffered and died to take away our sin. If you're here and you never have even asked Him into your heart yet, that's okay. I was here just like that too in a church like that before. And He wants you to give your heart to Him. And it's always a good time. It's never a bad time to whisper, Lord, I've never quite actually closed the deal with you and put on the ring, so to speak. I'd like to do that. I'd like to, to just give you my heart and become a member of the family of God. Oh, there's lots more to it than just saying that. But I want you to know, you can get it started right there by giving your heart to Him. Once you do that, the Bible says, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. What He'll do is, He'll come into your heart and put His Holy Spirit on you. Then the things that you used to not understand that seemed all like they're from some bizarre place in the Word of God will start coming through to you. You know why? Because the natural person cannot receive the things of the Spirit, the Bible says. But when you have the Holy Spirit, you can understand. When He, the Spirit of truth, comes... He will lead you into all truth. That's what the Word of God says. So it's beautiful. The new Jerusalem, heaven itself, is made from pearls, from the suffering. And there's so many promises of that. I don't have time to belabor it, but think about just a couple of those. Think about a rainbow. A rainbow comes after a storm right at the end when it's fading out. And the Lord, you know, it's not... The rainbow, it's not that it's just so you know, uniform. That's not the thing about the rainbow that makes it beautiful. It's the unity of it, of these beautiful colors. And God wraps them around the dying storm to give us a promise that He's always going to be there. He's never going to destroy us that way. He has a million ways of whispering to us, your, your day is going to be new every morning, and I'm going to bless you as your days are so, so your strength be. Now, I know I took the whole entire day on point number one, but I did it for a reason, because I want you to know, if you don't get anything else out of this message today, 
I want you to remember this, and maybe let's say it together. I'll say it first. I want you to repeat it back to me, okay? As your days, so shall your strength be. Let's say it together. Ready? Go. As your days, so shall your strength be. Now change it and say, as my days, so shall my strength be. Let's say it. Ready? Go. As my days, so shall my strength be. That's our declaration of praise. We trust God because that's the promise that He makes to us. Number two, if you're filling in the blank, before we finish up over here, I want you to put this. God gives His people heavenly watch care. He, I won't belabor this long because it's kind of self-evident, but He gives His people heavenly watch care. And that, what do you mean by that? Well, He watches you from heaven. He watches you with an omniscient, that means all-knowing, omnipresent, that means everywhere present, omnipotent, that means all-powerful, I and he sees you. You know this? He sees you as if there was only one of you. He sees me. His eye, the Bible says, is on the sparrow. So I know that he watches me. He's watching you. He sees a sparrow when it, when it falls. The reason the Bible says that over in Matthew 6 is because there's so many sparrows, the most common bird in the world. And it says that he, he even sees them when they fall. So don't be afraid. He sees you, and He cares. It says, there is none like God, O Jeshurun. And this is just a, right there is really just basically a poetic word for Israel, His people. There was a person, that, that's mentioned about four times in the Old Testament. You don't care, I don't care. But <laughs> Jeshurun means, O Israel, and it means to us too, the spiritual Israel in that sense, to you and to me. He says, there is none like God who rides through the heavens to your help. Through the skies in His majesty, He rides on the wings of the wind. Isn't that beautiful? God watches us and flies around, in a sense, like a beautiful eagle looking down with the clearest, most perspicacious uh, vision you could possibly imagine and sees a little rat or a little, uh, a little rabbit or whatever on the ground. And He's looking at us. He's watching over us saying, I see you and I love you and I want to take care of you and I will. I'll be there to watch over you. I'm watching over you and I'm with you. Us preachers, we, we like to study other preachers sometimes. I studied a Scottish guy when I was in seminary named Alexander McLaren. And Alexander McLaren has a real famous sermon. And you know what? It's going to seem so mundane at first and so prosaic when I tell you because his sermon talks about a time when he had to go walking home in a dangerous valley. You could call it the valley of death in a sense. You notice in Psalm 23 it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I walk... Well, Alexander McLaren was 16 years old. He got his first job, and it, he got hired to this village pretty far from their farmhouse, and it, it's six miles from his home. How many of you have run six miles every single morning? Yes, I know. I see that hand. Nobody raised their hand. Remember that one time I told you I run, I run six blocks every single morning? I, I go, I ran around the block six times today. And then I took the block and put it back in my kid's little. Uh, <laughs> but to run six miles, I'd love to. But this kid didn't want to because it was a tough terrain there. It was a rough place. So here's what happened. His father said, now, Alex, you get paid on Saturday. He says, I want you to come straight home. And he said, Daddy, I no, I can't do that. It's, that's dark. And they'd been having murders. They'd been having robberies in this valley. And it was so dark out there. It was scary. So what happened was, his dad looked at him and said, Alex, home. So Alex said, all right. So Saturday night came. He got his paycheck, tucked it in there, wondered if he's going to get home with it. And he set out. Sure enough, twilight fell. And here came darkness. And all this bad place with brigands and bandits and everything in this valley. So he's walking across there. And sure enough, he looks way across there. And it's pitch black, but he sees some movement. I mean, it was dark as a wolf's jaw in that place. And he sees this movement, and he goes, great. And he could tell from over there it was the biggest, meanest, murderous robber that he'd ever seen in his life. The guy was carrying a club, a gun, a bow and arrow, a slingshot. You know, a drumstick. I mean, he was carrying everything. I mean, that's what it looked like to him. And he saw him across there. He was freaking totally out. But he just dialed up a prayer to God, and he just kept going. His father said, come home. So he got closer and closer to this brigand, this bandit, and he looks, and he hears the sweetest voice he ever heard say, Alex, it's your father. Ah! And he ran over there and hugged his daddy. And his daddy walked with him. They walked side by side all the way back home. You know, I remember that story just because of this. I've been in that valley before, 
Haven't you been there? I've been walking there when it's dark and when it's foreboding and when I knew it was dangerous and knew you could get killed there. And I cried out to God and He came and I was able to hug Him and, and I could feel His presence with me and we walked together and there was no problem. That's what happened here. He says He looks down upon us. He says He rides through the heaven to your help through the skies in His majesty. Last point. God gives His people eternal protection. He gives them eternal protection. He watches over us, gives us refuge from the storm, gives us shelter from the fire and from the, the things that would destroy us and the predators. He gives us eternal protection. That's what to write there. Look, this is one of my most favorite passages in the whole Old Testament. It says, The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Underneath are the everlasting arms. I love that passage. By the way, what's a, what's a refuge? It's a, it's a dwelling place that nobody can get to you at. There's this guy that went over to England, and he, his friend said, let's go fox hunting tomorrow. And he goes, oh, you know, have you ever seen those fox hunts on TV? You know, this terribly British thing, you know? And they, they get on these horses, and they sound the trumpet, and they go riding off so gallantly, you know, hunting the fox. And the red fox is out there somewhere, and they get hounds that bark and bray. Have you ever seen that on TV and movies? Woof, woof, you know, they're going, da da And so this guy, he just said, you know, I don't really have a heart to go shooting any foxes. He said, how about we just sit up here on this promontory and watch it? And his guide said, oh, that's fine if you want to do that. You yanks are weird, and so sit down. So they sit down. This guy handed him some field glasses. He says, watch. So they're watching over there. And of course, the American guy, he wants to see the fox. So he's looking for the red fox all across there. He sees nothing. Here's these guys dressed up all formal on their beautiful horses. Here's the hounds braying and baying. And no fox. But finally, his guy gives him an elbow, and he says, look yonder. And he looks over by this cliff, and there's the old red fox. And he's sitting over there, and he's lifting his ears up and he kind of looks around a little bit, but he just sits back down and looks bored. The, the hounds sounded like they could kill a you know, T-Rex. You know the barking? But no, the fox is unperturbed. And so this guy's watching now, and the, the hounds are getting the scent. They're really powerful olfactory senses, and they're rushing over there. But guess what? The fox, he looks bored. So he gets up, stirs around a little bit, and then he walks over under this tree, sits down, starts licking his paws. This guy's looking, going, what is this? The fox must be deaf. That must be it. But no. Finally, the hounds start making a break. They get a few hundred feet away from that fox, and they're just beelining it to that fox. And then the fox, he sees him. He gets up, kind of looks at him, still kind of bored, nonchalant. And he traipses down there, and he does a little swing, and he jumps down under this cliff in a place that the hounds could no way keep their footing. And he so nimbly jumps under there in the den. And he's set. Guess what he was in? He's in a refuge. He's in a dwelling place, a place of safety and protection. And that's kind of what it's saying here. The eternal God is your dwelling place. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous runs to it and are safe. And what God wants us to do is run to Him when we're hurting, when we're scared, when we're in trouble. Run to Him and, and we're safe. And sometimes it looks like the things in this world are are a curse, but a lot of times God uses them for a blessing to our life. He uses us to help him. I heard a story about this boy who was uh, going off to his freshman year in college. He had an eccentric aunt. She was kind of odd. The only redeeming quality of this eccentric aunt, you know, she's the type that would always want a big sloppy kiss. Now, yeah, anybody have an aunt like that? You know, maybe not as much. And some cultures are more sloppy than others. Some cultures are more <laughs> touchy-feely than others. Once I was speaking up at Harvard, and I found out some of those guys, I asked them if any of you had parents that hugged you. Not one person raised their hand. Not one in, at Harvard. Double uh, ACF, Asian American Christian Fellowship. And there was about 123 people in there. None of them, they said their parents never hugged because we're not very touchy-feely in our culture. I said, okay. You know what we did that night? I had a big sermon prepared. I thought I was going to dazzle these Harvard guys. Yeah, right. I'm going to dazzle. But anyway, um, God told me to broom it. As I was going in there, I heard him whisper to my heart, broom your sermon. Fine, I, you and, I know you prepared it. Good, good lad, but broom it. You go in there, and here's what you do. You tell them, how many of you got hugged by your parents and, and hugged your parents back? Just about no one. And so then I said, I said that. I said, you know, I was going to preach a good sermon for you. I had Kierkegaard and Freud and, and you know, uh, I had all these great people that I know you Harvard people would love. And, and then I was ready for you. And then God said, no, don't do that. I'm not, I'm not doing that tonight. What you're going to go do is minister and let me minister. So you're going to start it off and get out of the way. 
great. So I went, and I told him that, and I said, I think the Lord's whispering to my heart tonight that a lot of you in here need the love of God, and you need the love of your parents too. You, you know, your parents love you, and they've shown it to you by helping you and providing for you and, and sacrificing for you, but that's the cultural way they did it. But you're hurting, you're aching for, for a hug. Well, God wants to give some of you a hug tonight. That's what I said, and because that's what I felt God was telling me. And so, you know what, that's about the stupidest thing in the world. You know, even a Texan could come up with that. I wanted to impress them. I studied for weeks in, in McAllister Library at Fuller trying to get ready for Harvard, right? So I'm there, and they're kind of... And so when I said that, though, I thought it was going to be where people go like this. You know. But you know what happened? As I said that, before I even finished, I started looking at people going like this. You know, and people rub their eyes because they're getting allergies. And pretty soon, I stood out of the way, and I said, well, if, you, if that resonates with you in any way whatsoever, I just want you to come up here and just pray for a few minutes and then we're going to just pray for each other. You know what? Every single person in that room, including the janitor, came forward <laughs> and prayed. And we spent the next three hours praying and weeping together and hugging together. Now, why am I telling you that? Because we need the everlasting arms. Because it says underneath are the everlasting arms. Sometimes things just don't seem to be what we think they are. And God disguises His blessings sometimes. You know, I was telling you about this aunt. She's kind of quirky and weird. So she gives this guy this book. I, I don't know if I wrote the name down, but it's a stupid... Here it is. Can you imagine you're going off to college. You've got a millionaire aunt, and here's what she gives you. A package, and you open it up, and it says, A Young Man's Safeguard in the Perils of the Age. How many of you are burning to read that sexy book? Raise your hand. Yeah, me too. Oh, I can't wait. You know, and I'm looking for the nearest circular file to file that thing, you know? <laughs> oh, good, a paperweight, you know? But this guy, he takes it down there to respect his aunt, and he gets there, and he puts it on his table, and he never touches it, of course. And here's what happened. His best friend up there that he had made came in his room one day, and he said, what's this? And he picks it up, and he goes, oh, don't look at that. I didn't buy that. Don't start busting my chops about it. And he says, oh, a young man's safeguard of the perils of the age. The guy has a little smirk, and he says, well, looks interesting. And he says, can I read it? And he goes, Sure. He goes, did you read it? He goes, nope. Are you kidding me? He says, all right, I'll read it. And he goes, no, you don't read it. You have it. You take it. Yeah, it's yours. God bless you. Read it in good health, right? So his, his friend takes the book. He takes it home. He comes back in a week and he says, you know something? Uh, I got your book. And he goes, no, 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 no. I gave it to you. Did you forget? What did you not understand about that? He goes, no, no, I'm giving it back to you. Uh, I'm too good a friend to keep it. He goes, what? He goes, I want to give it back to you. He says, why? He said, well, do, do me a favor, indulge me for a minute, sit down, take the book, and turn to page 30. He turns to page 30, because his friend's putting him through this, and he finds a crisp $100 bill. Then he turns over to page 40, there's another $100 bill, because his friend says, no, keep going, 50, he finds another one. Thank God it's about a 500-page book, because every 10 pages, there's a, there's a Benjamin in there. And so this guy... He can't believe his eyes. And then he still tries to split it with his friend. His friend says, no, that was meant for you. Your crazy, <laughs> ditzy aunt is really a loving, loving old gal, and she's trying to bless you. Well, why am I telling you that story? You know, I've thought about that a good bit. A lot of things in life that, that came my way, I just thought it was some stupid thing. Why did I have to go through this? What an idiotic thing. What a waste of... Have you ever gone to a movie and you realize you wasted two hours of your life? <laughs> Many of us have. You know? so who said that they came to a church service this morning that happened to them? I heard that. No, I'm just kidding. Nobody said that. I'm busting my own chops here. I'm kidding. But, but it's like... Sometimes the things that we think are so nothing and so boring, God has something beautiful hidden in them. Last story, then we're going to close up, okay? Or would you prefer I go 45 more minutes? Raise your hand. Yes, I see that hand. No, not one single hand in the room. <laughs> I'm joking. Somebody in the back row goes, oh, please, come on. But anyway, this is the last story. But I want you to hear this because here's what, it, to me, this sets it off. The eternal God is your dwelling place. The God who flies around and sees us and watches us to give us help. The guy who says, as your days are, so shall your strength be. The God of gods, the creator, it says the eternal God is your dwelling place. He whispers it through Moses. He whispers it into the word that it gets canonized, passed down through the ends of time to us here in California in 2020. And it says, and underneath are the everlasting arms. I want you to know that. So since I'm on the theme of these animals and foxes and field larks and stuff, let's close with, a, with another animal, okay? There's a, there's a beautiful way that eagles train their babies, the eaglets. You know what they do? 
they take these little eaglets and they feed them. You've seen the eagles, they just get, all they do at first few weeks is they just stay in their nest and go, grief, 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 feed me, feed me. By the way, when I first went to college, that's how I was with learning. I'd go to the classes and I'd go, feed me. Then I realized some of the stuff they fed me wasn't very good. But anyway, I digress. The, the eagle, his beak's open, and the mom and dad will go out and get birds and little mice and different things and, and uh, drop, in, drop in there sometimes, just worms, whatever. But after a while, guess what has to happen if it's going to be an eagle? A regal eagle, as they say, it's going to have to fly. So what happens when it has to fly? Well, here's what happens. It's beautiful. The mother eagle, the day will come, and the mother eagle will get that little bird, and she'll just get it with her big old powerful claws and talons and stick it back on her back. She'll ease over there to the edge of that nest, that cliff, and she'll go diving off there. And that little bird, you can imagine, is hanging on with its little talons, and it's just thousands of feet above the ground. It's flying, and then the mother will take it high and higher and higher, way up into the sky, and then when it's far enough up there, and it's time, she'll tilt her wings ever so gradually, so masterfully, it's amazing, and this little eaglet will go sliding off the mom, and it'll go sliding off, and when it gets in space, that eagle, that eagle will flap not just its wings, it'll flap everything that could be flapped. It starts going, I am going to die, <laughs> and it starts going off, even it knows. But you know what will happen? It's going sailing down through the air, and all of a sudden, this beautiful, amazing eagle will circle around and swoop down under it, and she'll, she'll catch her little eaglet on her back. And she'll do the same thing again, go up high, higher and higher into the sky and do it again until finally that eaglet starts flapping and realizes it can do it. It can fly. At first, it couldn't fly at all. Well, in my life, I've been that little eaglet so many, many times, and right now I am. In so many ways, God will take me into something that's beyond what I can do. It's out of my kin and kith, and it'll get to the point where I know I can't hack this. And then God will let me sail down through the air for just long enough to realize I'm doomed without Him. I'm nothing without Him. All of a sudden, He'll swoop down. And I can tell underneath are the everlasting arms. Underneath are the everlasting arms because the everlasting God, He has us. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, today, what I want to do is I want my brothers and sisters to get this out of your word, that as our days, so shall our strength be, Lord, and that you're, you're the one that there's nobody like you, and you ride on the wings of heaven to watch over us and to give us help. And Father, you said that you'll be our refuge, that everlasting God is, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And Father, I don't know what people are going through in here, but if somebody right now is going through something that feels like it doesn't make sense, it feels like you're not there, and we feel like saying, where the heck is God? In fact, Lord, help them to know we're free falling because you're teaching us. You're doing something that's going to make us into a person that's majestic, that someday we'll be able to mount up with wings as eagles. And Father, so please help us to take courage and take heart. You'll said you'll never fail us or forsake us. You whisper to our heart that as your days are, so shall your strength be. And I will help you from heaven and watch over you. And I will be your refuge and underneath, no matter how hard it gets in this world, underneath are the everlasting arms. Thank you for those beautiful promises, a promise for every day. Jesus, we pray these things in your holy, matchless name. Amen and amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor Ewan, for giving us that word.